were a little bit confused and try to clarify it by them. Um, and uh, so what I want to do is talk about this concept of the waiting time distribution. It was, it's actually an important concept. It sort of has an uh, important historical um, context in, in quantum optics, uh, in thinking about um, particularly resonance fluorescence, a problem that we discussed last semester, where you're shining light resonantly or near resonantly on a time of transition and looking at the photons that are emitted spontaneously. And as we saw, the statistics of those photons was one of the first indicators of non-classical light, the anti-bunching. And so that's where this idea first came out, but it then had a follow-up in the context of uh, these Monte Carlo simulations uh, and quantum trajectories uh, that we're discussing right now. So what we showed last time was that it, the probability that there will be no jumps, that there will be, in the context of the two-level atom, no spontaneously emitted photons for a time tau uh, if given at time t, we know that there was a jump. Then that probability is given by uh, the square of the norm of the evolved state, evolved according to this non relation Hamiltonian. Okay? So the decaying norm tells us something about this probability. One minus that is what we would call the cumulative wait time, okay? That's the probability that uh, there will be a jump sometime before that time tau, okay, one minus that. Okay, that's not quite the thing that I said it was. The thing that I said it was is this, which is, what is really called the wait time or the wait time probability density. This is the probability that given there was a jump at time t, what's the probability that the next jump will be at time tau later within a small time interval d tau? Obviously, the time of the next jump itself is a set of measure zero. You have to have some interval. This is a continuous variable t, okay? So what is this w, the weight time distribution? That weight time distribution can be written this way, okay? So that's the probability that um, a jump happens, you know, jump in interval d tau around t plus tau, okay? So around that tau. So that's tau later given that there was a jump at time t, okay? Times the probability uh, that there is no jump from time t to tau, okay? Uh, no, what am I saying? Yeah, yeah, right. So there's no jump from t to tau, and then at time tau, it jumps within that time interval. Okay, we agree? Okay, so this we just wrote down. That's this thing, where pj means post-jump. That's the probability of not having a jump from t to tau. And then at time tau, around the time interval dt, I jump. And the probability of that is 1 minus the probability of no jump in that little time interval. 
Detail. Detail, indeed. Thank you. Detail. So we can rearrange that in the way we've done before. Renormalize this. This thing combines with that to be the probability of no jumps in the time interval from t to t plus tau plus d tau. And then this is the probability of no jumps from t to tau. So that's w in times d tau. And if I then divide by d tau and the limit that is a differential, then this waiting time distribution is nothing more than the derivative of this function, which we then can integrate. So as I said, this cumulative distribution, which is the integral of all waiting time, the wait that have to wait a time tau after a jump happens at time t, integrated over tau, is 1 minus the probability of no jumps. Phew. Thank you, Gopi, for helping me clarify that. For years, I've never completely understood this, and I had to work it out. So I think we've got it out. So what is done in this version of the Monte Carlo simulation? What we're doing is not simulating directly the time to the next jump, but simulating the cumulative probability distribution. This is a trick that I didn't know about in statistics. For example, if you want to simulate a normal distribution, it's easier to simulate the integral because that finding a particular rent in a continuum of a distribution, it's a set of measure zero. So instead you simulate the integral and you say, what's the probability that uh, the integral of this distribution is going to be less than some maximum value? And that's what we're doing in this simulation. And it's, so, there's something called the inverse sampling theorem. You can read about it on Wikipedia or whatever, which says that to simulate this distribution, what I have to do is the following. I pick a random number that's uniform on the interval between 0 and 1. And then I find the value tau that satisfies this function equals that uniform random variable. What the inverse sampling theorem tells us is that the solution to this is sampled from this probability distribution. So it's a way of turning a uniform probability distribution into sampling from this distribution. That's what the inverse sampling theorem tells us. I'm not going to prove it because I can't. <laughs> I have to really study it, but that's the theorem. Okay, and so what is done in this way of doing the quantum Monte Carlo simulation of a quantum trajectory is to simulate the cumulative distribution and just simulate the wait time until we see the, the cumulative probability accumulates to the point of x, and then you jump. Okay. Then why do we jump at that point and not earlier, for example? Because, Be that's because then we've accumulated that amount of probability. Mm -hmm. The cumulative probability. So that's what's shown here. Otherwise, we have, at the early time, we have that, that's not consistent that it was dark for that period. One minus that period that there was no jumps for that time. Um, okay, I want to show you a couple of things. Um,
Here we are. Computer one. So here is an example taken for, this is one of the papers that I mentioned in our homework assignment. This was one of the classic early papers that first laid out a particular, uh, this kind of algorithm for doing uh, this quantum trajectory. They didn't call it quantum trajectories in this paper, but that's what we call it now. And so this was an example where, uh, they're doing, uh, looking at damped Rabi oscillations of the kind we discussed in the last lecture. We're driving an element with a laser field, and then it can also spontaneously decay. Okay? And so, uh, what's simulated here, you can either simulate one minus the norm or the norm itself. They're both distributed equally well between in this random interval and just simulate by picking these random numbers when the next jump is going to happen and then jumping. Now, one thing I wanted to mention. So, um, Jonathan brought up a very good point. This was a picture I had in my mind which shows the evolution of the normalized state. In, in, in this particular paper, uh, the way that uh, things are defined, um, the unnormalized state is without the tilde, and the normalized state is with the tilde, okay? But I typically be right at the other way these days, so uh, I'm sorry if that's going to be confusing. But notice that this thing looks like a damped Rabi oscillation. However, this particular example is not done on resonance. This example is done detuned from resonance. And when you're detuned from resonance, you don't go all the way up to the top of the block sphere. And I never noticed that. When you do go to the top of the block sphere, uh, here's what it looks like. So this is a case where you're on resonance your Rabi frequency is three times the spontaneous addition. This is the same kind of Monte Carlo simulation. But as was suggested and correct, when you're on resonance, even though you are evolving according to the non-hermitian Hamiltonian, which is always taking probability out of the excited state and putting it into the ground state, during the times you don't see spontaneously emitted photons. It doesn't mean that at some point you don't end up when you're driving the system with unit probability to be at the excited state. What it means is that these oscillations are nonlinear. And so you were correct about that, Jonathan. And thank you for clarifying the confusion I've long had in my head about that as well. So those are two things that Hopefully now for the people on YouTube is clear. Okay. <laughs> All right. Very good. Um, all right. So I did want to say one other thing about this wait time distribution uh, that is useful and interesting. Uh, and that's uh, for the particular case where we're looking at a two-level atom that is, can spontaneously emit and make a quantum jump from the excited state to the ground state, we can calculate this function exactly and analytically. And it, as I said, historically, this was done long before people started to think about quantum trajectories because people were thinking about um, the nature of resonance fluorescence and what are the statistics of the photons that are emitted when we're driving it. And then later was used to think about this problem of quantum jumps in the three-level V transition. 
So let me just quickly write that down because it's, it's interesting that you can just write down the analytic formula. And it tells you essentially everything you would want to know about the statistics of the spontaneously emitting photons when they're driven by a laser field near residence. Okay, so what is that distribution? Well, there it is. It's the probability that I have no jump in this time interval, given the fact uh, that um, I just jumped at uh, time t. Okay, so w And then the probability, what's the probability to jump in interval uh, tau to tau plus d tau? Well, that's given by the probability to be uh, in the excited state which is given by this, divided by the norm of this. Times gamma v tau. <coughs> okay, so that's the probability in this particular case that the, given the jump operator that we described before, this is the probability that in this time interval between tau and tau plus d tau, I will jump, given that there was no jump from zero to tau. All right, so the w is the multiplication of these. So W of tau is this times this, so we can write it down. And it's easy in this case. It says W of tau, D tau, is equal to 
the probability to be in the excited state, but not the probability, but the amplitude according to the non-permission Hamiltonian times gamma d tau. Because this cancels this when I multiply this times this. So all I have to do is look at the evolution under the deterministic but not Hermitian Hamiltonian and see what the probability amplitude is in the excited state. I multiply that, I square that, and then divide by the tau, and that's W. And that's a problem we can solve. It's basically the problem of, I mean, H, her, H affected in this case is equal to minus H bar delta over 2, or I can write it with the ground state, minus delta plus I gamma over 2. plus the Rabi oscillation. That's H effective. So if we look at the specific case on resonance, I mean, we know the solution to this problem is the Rabi solution. Which tells me that the probability amplitude squared to be in the excited state given this evolution, given uh, the um, case that at time t equals zero, or tau equals zero, the state is the ground state, is the Rabi solution. And that's equal to the Rabi frequency squared divided by the effective Rabi frequency square times the sine of the effective Rabi frequency tau over 2 e to the minus gamma tau over 2. Where if I look at the case where on resonance, which is the case that we most often look at this, this is equal to the square root I times gamma over 2 plays the role of the detuning here. So where we might have had omega squared plus delta squared, we have this instead. But otherwise, the solution is exactly the same as the Rob solution. So this is the famous waiting time distribution uh, uh, in uh, quantum optics which tells us, for example, that the, the waiting time that I'll see a, the next spontaneous emission immediately after the first is zero. Because the sine of tau is zero. So this is an indicator of anti function That is to say, if I see the uh, photon spontaneous emitted at one time, the probability I'm going to see another photon right after that is zero. I have to wait some time for the atom to get re-excited, and then it can spontaneously emit. And basically, all of the statistics of uh, the process of resonance fluorescence are contained within this distribution function. So we don't really need to do Monte Carlo simulation for this. I mean, we, we, could, we know what the waiting time distribution is. We could just use that as the dice and, and make the jumps according to this distribution and then average it and we'll see the damn Rabi oscillations. But it's fun to do it on the computer too and see how it works. All right? All right, very good. All right, so I want to turn our attention now, broaden the discussion a bit. And in particular, I want to talk about a slightly more interesting, perhaps, situation than our two-level atom. Okay. 
So I want to go beyond the two-level atom, or the simple harmonic oscillator. And in particular, what I want to do is let's think about an atom with degenerate magnetic sublevels. We're going to use this as a um, motivator to think about the, this idea of different unravelings of the master equation uh, into different kinds of quantum trajectories, all of which, when averaged over all possible measurement records give the same master equation. Okay, that's where we're headed with this. But in order to get there, let's think about the following problem. So you may or may not remember that, of course, when we have atoms, atoms generally have angular momentum quantum numbers, and there are generally not just one level with that energy, but multiple solar levels. So for example, suppose I have an excited state that has a total angular momentum j that I'll say is 2, and a ground state that has a total angular momentum of 1. That's a allowed dipole transition. So this is the total angular momentum of the atom. Okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So my n sub j's I'll call them ME, but these are the eigenstates of JZ. In this case, go from minus 2 to plus 2. And for J equals 1, we'll call them the NGs. They're the NEs and the NGs. They're also the eigenstates. Okay? So my good quantum numbers here are J. With whatever the ground state is, you know, maybe it's got a principal quantum number and or you know some other quantum numbers, whatever the ground state is, mg, and then the excited state has these quantum numbers. G and E stand for all the other quantum numbers that specify the orbital. Okay, so now you remember that if we start, if the atom starts in one of these sublevels, so-called Zeeman sublevels or magnetic sublevels, it can spontaneously decay. And it can spontaneously decay into different magnetic sublevels. However, there are selection rules. And I can only change the projection of uh, the angular momentum quantum number in this kind of transition, a dipole transition. This is an electric dipole transition. When the m quantum number increases by plus or minus 1 or stays the same. Okay, so this is a possibility. If it's over here, it can only go over here. If it's over here, it can do that, or it can do that, or it can do that. This guy can go here, or here, etc. Oops, that's bad. That's good. All right, you got it? So, um, what we want to describe is how would we, without deriving all the born Markov stuff, just by guessing, what is the master equation that describes the, or at least the Lindblad relaxation part of the master equation that describes this kind of spontaneous decay? Well, what we see here is that there are different kinds of jump operators depending upon which of these kinds of transitions happen. And these transitions that happen are associated with different polarizations of fo the photon. 
That is to say, in these kinds of dipole transition, the change in the angular momentum projection of the atom is taken up by the photon. And it's all in the photon spin, or its polarization. So if the magnetic quantum number is changing by plus 1, then uh, if it's increased by plus 1, it has to take away one unit of helicity from the photon vice versa, or no units of policy. So um, what we have is the selection rules follow from the wigner eckhart theorem. different photon polarizations correspond to the uh, photon component along the direction axis, it's the direction along which we are defining uh, the um, projection of the angular momentum of the atom, and then two orthogonal directions, which are the circular polarization. So Q is plus minus? Or? Q is 0 plus or minus 1. This is what's known as the spherical basis. Because it has to do with spherical harmonics. So we look at the component DQ is the projection of the dipole operator onto this direction in the complex space. Okay, So this tells me how much of the dipole is oscillating along the z-axis linearly, and how much of the dipole is rotating circularly, either clockwise or counterclockwise, relative to the fixed z-axis. You can always break up any vector into those components. And what the wigner eckhart theorem tells me, put on wet, tells me that the matrix element of a vector operator, particularly the dipole operator, between uh, states of definite angular momentum is equal to the following. There's a piece of it that has nothing to do with the direction in space, but just the magnitudes of everything. And that's known as the reduced dipole matrix element. And then everything else has to do with the addition of angular momentum. And that Additional angular momentum is taken into account by the Klebsch Gordon coefficient associated with adding angular momentum of the ground state, adding the angular momentum of the photon, which has h bar of angular momentum and projection q. So if the photon is circularly polarized, with right-hand helicity relative to the z-axis, it has one unit of angular momentum along the z-axis. If it's left-hand, it has negative one. And if it's linearly along z, it has q equals zero. This is the Clevis Borden coefficient. Now, you should have learned this in your quantum mechanics class, and if you didn't, 
I'm sorry, but you should have. Everyone should know that they were happy. Okay. All right, so what that says is that each one of these transitions occurs with an amplitude weighted. They're all the same, except for the Klebs-Gordon coefficient. Everything else about them is the same, except that there's an amplitude for these that is, that is the Klebs-Gordon coefficient. Okay. So with that said, I can write down for you what the jump operators are. Let's do it over here. Remember that the rates depend on the square of the matrix elements. So they depend on the squares of these elliptic coefficients. But the amplitudes depend on the coefficients themselves. So we define jump operator for each projection Q of the spontaneous photon. Okay? So in the two-level atom, we basically, this is a two-level atom. Because there's only one way it can go. So we didn't bother taking into account Q, because this is a, what we call a cycling transition. If I go up here, I can go back down here. This is what's used for laser cooling, because you can shoot that ping pong ball for a long time and make many, many, many scatter. Okay? This is not a two bevel atom, because it can go here or here or here. So I kind of take into account all three levels. And there are different gems for each Q. So let's write down one for E. Q. I'll write down L for Q is the following. It's the square root of gamma, because they're all proportional to the same thing, times the sum over all the m sub g's, all the m sub e's, the Klebs Gordon coefficient that connects me between those sublevels times the thing that takes me from that excited state to that ground state. Okay? So for a given Q, this is the jump operator. It takes me from that excited maximum sublevel to the particular ground state weighted by the Klebsch Gordon coefficient that connects them, given that it's spontaneously emitted that Q. Now, you will remember the fact, of course, that these Klebsch Gordon coefficients vanish unless they satisfy certain selection rules, the addition of angular momentum. Now, we've already chosen the fact that J, G is the addition of angular momentum plus one. So that's fine. The only thing that this is true that this is a delta function unless, I mean, this is zero unless mg is equal to mg plus q. So, I mean, proportional to that, it's it's a number. It's zero unless it's true of something like that. So we can write this just as if we like the sum just over the, say, the excited states. where we write mg is equal to m minus q. And I go from the excited state to the ground state that has that much more angular momentum if I admitted q. Right? Now. 
So, right. Okay. So those are uh, this. This is sometimes called for a dipole, a dimensionless dipole operator, D. So let us write down the master equation. explore this a little bit more deeply. Um, firstly, given this, we can calculate what is the spontaneous emission rate between any two uh, levels. That is to say, what is the rate of transition between uh, some excited state, sublevel, and some ground state. You remember that that transition rate is given by the square of the Lindlatt operator. And this I'm going to call gamma sub q for that, those levels. What is that? Well, given this, that's just equal to gamma times the square of the fed Gordon coefficient. So each one of these transitions occurs with a fraction that's given by the square of the fed Gordon coefficient. Moreover, if I look at the sum of this, sum over the three q's, well, that's equal to gamma times the sum of the Clebsch-Gordon coefficients. But this is not zero ex except for a particular mg. So I can sum this over all mg without changing anything, because there's only one mg that this is non-zero for. And then when I sum over both mg and q, using the completeness relation, this is one. So that means the following. Oh. <clears throat> that the, the 
branching ratios from an excited state to all possible ground states adds to one. So let me ask you, just without your Mathematica or your graphic calculator, what is this cleft Gordon coefficient? It has to be one, right? So these cycling transitions have to be one because there's only one way it can go, and if this is going to be gamma, then that's it. Whereas these things are some fraction of one, such that this plus this squared, this cleft Gordon coefficient squared plus this squared is one. Same thing for these three. Yes, sir. Um, so, so I guess the way that we've chosen a jump operator is this is a particular unraveling of the quantum trajectory. Indeed it is. But so then, I guess my question is that if we have three jump operators and operationally we can only, you know, I mean assuming we use some sort of orthogonal measurement, we can only measure two spin or two uh, photon polarizations, then how, I mean, how would we actually realize this, like, operationally? Like in terms of you know actually viewing some sort of random evolution that when we you know, yeah I mean how, you're saying how do we actually detect all three polarizations yeah, yeah. yeah I mean we would have to I mean of course it's a little bit tricky the um, you need to have detectors distributed over four pi mm -hmm. and the um, polarization that of an atom, I mean, the polarization of a photon that the atom emits depends also on the direction of propagation of that photon, yeah. right? So there's a correlation. So if the, if the atom is, say, oscillating along this direction, so that's a case where it's di, and let's call that the z-axis, then if I'm looking here, I can't see any of those photons. Whereas I'm, if I'm looking here, I can see those photons. And I would have to look at, you know, I'd have to somehow beam split off. I'd have to, I'd have to do a, a kind of POVM on the photon polarization that allows me to correlate what polarization it could have been. I can measure all three directions as long as I beam split off part of the direction. Um, I'd have to think about that a lot yeah, harder yeah, to see cool. whether that can be, how you would actualize that, I bet it can be. Okay. But for the moment, it's not that important. Okay. okay, for the moment, the key is, as we will see, this corresponds to, as you're conceptualizing, a, a particular case where we not only measure whether a photon was emitted or not, but that it has a particular projection of its polarization along a space fixed axis that we're calling Z. Okay. That's the concept at the moment. All right. Um, there's another piece to this puzzle. Uh, well, there are many pieces, but. Uh, what about the effect of Hamiltonian, D dagger D? Um, let's look at that here. So if I look at the sum over Q of D dagger D, well, there's D. Got to write this out. This is equal to gamma. I have a sum over M, E, and M, E prime. I'm going to use this form of it, which is a sum over one of the indices. And then I have and then these are real, so I don't have to bother starring them. And then I have J, M, E, J, G, mg equals me minus q. That's the dagger. And now I have jg me prime minus q. jge me prime times the Clef Gordon coefficient 
and B prime J one Q J G and E minus Q prime. Not Q prime, and F prime. Okay. Now this is delta any any prime. So uh, that means that this is the same bench Gordon coefficient, which means I can square it. And now if I sum this over Q, I guess I forgot that over here, this again is 1. There's no gamma here because these are the D's, not the L's. So that's as we would expect it. This is the projector is sum over Ne. I mean sum over Q. This is the sum over Ne is the projector onto the excited state, as we would expect. So now we have a way of viewing our quantum trajectories. Before that, can I ask a question? You can. Uh, so, I'm a bit confused uh, about the, the picture of the Klebsch coefficient. Uh, uh, yeah, which has to be equal to 1 because LQ is the sum over excited and, and ground state uh, uh, ME and MG, right? The LQs, yes. The LQ. So, it, so uh, if LQ is is, is a, a jump with a particular Q, correct? Right. Irrespective of a particular excited state, I mean. Yeah, exactly. So, I, I thought that when we sum over Q over the gamma Q, we should get. This is for a particular, ah, this is particular, for a particular M sub B. Okay, that's You're right. If I started in a general state, it would be more complicated. Okay. But if my initial state is this, that's what I'm calling okay. gamma Q. It's true, it's a, the language is a little confusing because there's no label here on the left. Uh, that side. was my confusion. Yes. Yeah. Right. So this is, if I start in this particular yep. excited state, this is the rate of transition. But you are also correct that if I start in some superposition of excited states, well then it's not just a clipped gordon coefficient, it's a much more complicated expression. Okay, so what we have in this picture then, just to summarize the conceptual piece of this, is the following.
So we ask ourselves, are you in the excited manifold? There's this probability to be in the excited manifold. That's the sum of all the probabilities to be in one of these sublevels. That's what we had for the two-level atom. It's a probability to be in the excited state. But now it's in the sum of any one of these excited states. Given that probability, you're going to jump with this probability. Given the probability dp, you'll jump in that time interval dt weighted by this. Is that squared? No, it is not. That's because it's the projector. Thank you, Charles. Absolutely not. The projector. Um, OK. And then you say, OK, given that a jump happened, which jump happened? Because we know that with this probability, I, in that time interval, I will spontaneously emit. But now I have to ask myself, which kind of spontaneous emission happened? Because the environment can distinguish. These are orthogonal choices. Now, I don't know how the experiment does. Like, wave your hands, POBM, beam splitter, but anyway, something can happen. And we, in principle, it's an orthogonal measurement. It can be done. I don't know how. But we imagine it could. OK? And then, since it could, there is an orthogonal measurement record for that. And we ask which jump happened. So we pick Q according to what probability distribution. Well, the probability that Q happened is dpq over dp, right? Where dpq is the probability of one of these guys, right? So that's equal to. Uh, divided by the probability to be in the excited state. That's the fraction of the time that this particular spontaneous emission will happen. Now, if the state at time t were one of the magnetic sublevels, that's just the Clebsch Gordon coefficient. But if it's in a superposition of these, then it's a more complicated expression. All right. So, with that said, we're going to look at a very interesting phenomenon. The phenomena that we studied last semester of coherent population traffic. The case where a multi-level atom of this sort has a dark state, a state that does not couple to a driving laser field. Okay, so what we're going to talk about we're going to use this formalism that we've just developed and this framework that we've just thought about to talk about coherent population. CPT. So let me remind you about that. Let's consider the special case where my excited state has angular momentum 1. And my ground state also has uh, total angular momentum 1. Now, of course, this has to come from some kind of spin orbit because we have to have delta L changed by 1. But J can stay the same for your dipole selection rule. OK? But that's OK. So there are three magnetic sublevels here and three magnetic sublevels here. Okay. Now in this particular case, I will write down the Clebsch Gordon coefficients that I don't know by heart. I know everything about them by heart except their signs, and their signs are critical. So 
Everything is root over root 2. So this is equal to minus 1 over root 2. This is minus 1 over root 2. This is plus 1 over root 2. This is minus 1 over root 2. This is plus 1 over root 2. And this is plus 1 over root 2. I hope that is daily legible. There is no zero to zero. And this is zero. This clip coefficient vanishes. The fact that that vanishes is actually a indication that there is a dark state in the problem, that there is a state that does not couple, okay, that there, you cannot conserve angle momentum by that transition. It doesn't work. Okay? The sum of angle momentum is zero in that case. It was zero to zero. N equals zero to N equals zero. So, um, however, let us, so what we're going to do is take this system and we're going to look at coherent population trapping. CPT is a phenomenon where we drive the system with a coherent laser. And in steady state, due to spontaneous emission, we are pumped into a dark state. A state that cannot absorb any photons from the laser. Okay. So in order to do that, we need to have part of our Hamiltonian be the Rabi part. Our Hamiltonian is h bar down or 2. But instead of sigma x, like we had before, we have this multi-level system. And it will look like this. The polarization of the laser uh, dotted into D plus D, where D is equal to sum over Q EQ star. Here are the stars. Yeah, this guy's got the star in this side though. Okay, so what is this telling me? This is saying that the atom can absorb or be stimulated to emit according to the laser polarization. So if the laser is polarized along the z-axis, well, that means it only has a component along zero, in which case it only drives the transitions like this. If the laser is polarized perpendicular to the z-axis, it has x and y components, well then it drives the sigma transitions. These are called the pi transitions, and this is sigma plus, and this is sigma minus. This is sigma minus, this is sigma plus. Now here's an important point. An important point. Pi, sigma plus, and sigma minus are defined relative to a space-fixed axis that we're calling the quantization axis. It's not the direction of propagation of light. It can be. We can choose to quantize the atoms. We can choose to define the projection of angular momentum along the direction of propagation. But we don't have to. We can choose it any way we like and just say that these are the projection of angle momentum with respect to some space fixed axis, an axis that we're calling the z axis. Anything we like. Okay? And we'll choose two different ones to get two different unravelings of the master plan. So, let's see. 
let's begin. And we'll finish this on Thursday. Let's suppose, so to reiterate that, the z-axis is known as space fixed. It's some axis that we choose in space. It's not body fixed. It's not relative to the body of the photon, the, the k vector of the photon. It's somewhere in space. We call it the z-axis. Let's choose the polarization of the laser to be the y-axis. Okay. So what I'm saying is, this is there's the z-axis. That's the direction in which we are defining these magnetic subliminals right now. So these are really, you know, m respect to the z-axis. And we're choosing linear polarization along the y-axis. Okay. Which transitions are driven in this? This is linear polarization. Sigma plus sigma, sigma, plus sigma minus. Okay. It's a freshman rookie error to say, oh, it's linear polarization. These are the linear transitions. No, 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 no. They're only linear if I chose the z-axis along here. Well, then that would be. But this is a superposition of sigma plus and sigma minus. In fact, it is equal to e plus, uh, oh god, this is going to have sines. So plus and minus is equal to minus plus you got to put that in if you're going to get all the clipboard coefficients right. E x plus or minus i e y over root 2. So this is equal to uh, right? That's the y. The equal superposition with the same sign in that overall phase out front. So that's EL. So that means that my Hamiltonian here is, I'm on resonance, so I don't have any tuning. I got this factor uh, 1 over I root 2 d plus plus d minus minus d plus dagger minus d minus dagger. Not plus. Yeah, no, 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 no. That's right. Okay. So what this is saying is that the atom laser interaction <laughs> 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 I think they're using some of that uh, street chalk or the sidewalk chalk or whatever. Yeah, really? Yeah. The Crayola. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the atom laser interaction involves absorption and emission of sigma plus and sigma minus photons with a sign uh, here. Um, that uh, is, is because of this I. Okay? Alrighty. So, that means that if I redraw my atomic energy level structure, as far as the, uh, so this is my excited manifold, this is my ground manifold. The term manifold is used in a stupid way to not do a manifold, but it's just, you know, not, it's not differential geometry I'm talking about here, but that's what people say. Um, I can, if I start here, I can go here. If I start here, I can go here and back and forth on the laser, but this is the absorption. And if I start here, 
I can go here. Okay. Um, however, uh, if I start in this level or this level, I can never get to this level because I cannot spontaneously decay to this level. So if I start here, I can decay back here. And if I start here, I can decay back here, or I can decay from here, I can absorb here and decay there, I can absorb here and decay here, but I can never get to that one. So if I start somewhere in the subspace between the m equals plus one and the m equals minus one, I will always stay in that subspace. Okay? So let us restrict our attention then to that case. We're going to start in one of these two levels. So if we begin in G, and now I'm not going to write the J because for that. Oh, I just write it G and G equals plus or minus one. All dynamics. Coherent and spontaneous. Remain. Now, we can look at two states, one that I'm going to call the bright state, and one I'm going to call the dark, well, let's do it the other way around. One I'm going to call the dark state, and the other I'm going to call the bright state. The dark state for this choice of laser field is the following. Why is that true? Well, because if I start in that superposition, then these two paths destructively interfere. They destructively interfere because they have the opposite sign of the Clegg Gordon coefficient. Okay. That is to say, if you, this state, we're calling the dark state, that the atom laser interaction acting on this is zero. That's because these two paths have equal and opposite signs and destructive interference. of absorption. Okay. So this state is a dark state. If I start in the symmetric superposition of these two states, nothing will happen. The opposite state, the state with the anti-symmetric superposition, is the bright state. That state will absorb. Yeah? Does the interpretation of the bright and the dark state switch if we change from X to Y, y polarization? Yeah. It does. OK. Yeah. Indeed. So it depends on the polarization okay. of the light. Okay. 
Okay, let me conclude this long and perhaps tedious lecture uh, with the following preview. Let's just ask the question of the following. Let's just intuit the following. Suppose at t equals zero, the state is in MD equals minus one. Okay. So that's this, it's in this state. That state is a superposition of the bright state or the dark state and the bright state. It's that particular superposition. Okay. What's going to happen? Well, it's going to absorb and emit, and absorb and emit. And the phenomena of coherent population trapping says that eventually, in steady state, we pump into the dark state. However, how does that look from the point of view of any quantum trajectory? This phenomenon we studied last semester from the point of view of the master equation. We did, even though we didn't know Lindblad and all that. We still had a formulation of the master equation. And we found the steady state solution. But if that's a steady state solution, every single uh, um, quantum trajectory ultimately gets into that state. So how would we see that in a particular instantiation of this as a quantum trajectory in a function of time? Let's look at the probability to be in the excited state according, I mean, in the dark state as a function of time according to one of these stochastic evolutions. At time t equals zero, I am, have a 50% chance of being in the dark state. Okay. Over time, what happens? Well, if I don't see a photon, I have to update the state according to the effect of Hamiltonian. And the effect of Hamiltonian will have the effect of rotating me towards the dark state. Because if it was the bright state, I would have more probability of seeing a photon. If I would, and the, the math will do that. If you apply the effect of Hamiltonian with that non emission part to it, what you will find is that you'll start rotating to the dark state. Now, maybe you weren't really in the dark state. And there's some probability amplitude later on. There's more here than here now, or more here than here. I mean, I get rid of the bright state and I spontaneously emit. If I spontaneously emit, I have to choose. Either I, have a, I emit a sigma plus, or I emit a sigma minus. In which case, I jump into either this state or that state. If I'm in the state, n equals plus one, I'm again in an e equal to a position of bright and dark, just the opposite one. So if a jump happens, I'm back halfway. But then maybe I rotate a little bit more, and then I jump. And then eventually, over a long time, I will get to the bright state. So, well, it's not supposed to be tilted. <laughs> This is one possible quantum trajectory. And when you average many, many of these realizations according to this statistics, what you would find is that ultimately you would get some smooth curve like the one that we found by solving the mass free. Many, 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 many um, trajectories would give you this with some noise around it depending on how many you have. 
But the interesting part of this problem is that we get to the dark state by not seeing the photon. All right. What we will do next time, though, is show that if we unravel the master equation with respect to a different set of jump operators, we get a very different interpretation of what happens. I'm trying to make sense of all of that. So that's where we're headed. How do we do this?